Amen, amen. Let me add my welcome, everybody, Eastview family, glad you're here. Guests and visitors, if you're watching us online, especially, I think we have a lot of our high school students in here today. If you're with us, we're so glad that you guys are here. This is going to be different than most of our worship services. Uh, so if you're visiting, uh, come back next week. We usually sing a lot more worship songs, and uh, we spend some more time in prayer and baptism. But today is a special Sunday. It's a war Sunday. Uh, when we started this Joshua series uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, we planned this out. We said we're going we're to declare war against three things in our, in our community, in our world, our society, our culture. And uh, last uh, August was sexuality, and we talked about the sexuality of this culture. Today we're going to talk about money, and I know that everybody here is interested in it because you either have a bunch of it or you don't have enough of it. And uh, so we're going to talk about money today. I think it's appropriate, the only good way for us to start this worship service today about money is for us to pass the offering trays. All right? Now, I know you're sitting there going, okay, there it is. I'm visiting, and this church and that pastor is all about my money. They got this big dollar sign on the stage. Uh, this is what you guys are all about. When I was growing up, uh, I remember this distinctly. I can't remember the guy's name. I'm not even sure the church that I was at, but I was a little kid, and I saw this old guy put a $20 bill in the offering plate as it passed, and then he kind of rummaged around in the change there, and he pulled out a 10. I mean, he made, he made change in the offering plate, which is really poor form. You really should not do that, right? I remember that as a kid. It's like, why didn't you just leave the 20 in there? But today, we're going to do that. We're going to pass the plates today, but we're not going to ask you to give we're going to ask every one of you to take something. So ushers, if you would, make your way down. We're going to pass the plates today. If you came today and you're a part of Eastview Church and uh, you guys want to, you guys are all shocked. You're like, you're seriously giving something away? Yes, we're going to pass the plates and we want you to take an envelope. Every person in here, we've made an arrangement for this to happen. So pass the plates, take an envelope. I'll tell you what to do with everything in there in just a moment. If you came today as a part of Eastview Christian Church and you came to give your tithes or your offerings in the offering plate. We're not going to pass it for an offering time. In the back, we have the boxes that we normally put our dollar offering in. You can put your offerings in there today, and, um, and then we'll, we'll give our offering that way today in the name of God, all right? So here's the deal. We're going to talk about money, and in probably the most expensive opening sermon illustration I've ever done in my life, I'm passing out envelopes to you today. In these envelopes, uh, we've arranged for $50,000 to be given away today to the congregation at Eastview Christian Church. So as you take these envelopes, you guys are like shocked. <laughs> what? What? Uh, in, in these envelopes, you'll find a, a card that just says money at the top. And on one side, it's, a, it's something for help. And so there's a chance for you to later in the service check something, say, I need some help in this way. On the other side, it's a commitment about money. So just hold on to that card. But for the rest of you, I see you're already peeking in there. Look inside. There's, there's a bill inside there. Some of you got fives. Some got tens. Some's got, some got 20s. Some of you even got 50s or $100 bills. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a game show. <laughs> Woo! Come on down. This money uh, is sure you're waving it. People are waving it in the air. Man, wouldn't it be great if offering was this fun every Sunday? <laughs> Woo! I'm giving money. This is awesome. Okay, so here's the deal. I want you to hold on to that money. It's in an envelope so you won't lose it. You know what it is. And, uh, and we're going to come back to that later and come back to this card later um, because we want to really deal with this, this serious, serious issue of our money. And so today you have money, uh, and, and I hope you understand this. When you came in here today, um, you, you didn't earn this money. Uh, it, you weren't expecting this money. Um, in some ways you're shocked that we gave you this money. And, uh, and it crossed our minds when we started giving this out today. We thought, what if we lose $50,000, right? Because we don't have unlimited supplies like God has, right? So what is this all about? Well, really, this giving away of money is an illustration of a story that Jesus told in Matthew 25. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 25 today. And uh, if you're tired of listening to me already... Let me settle in because this is going to be about the next hour and 10 minutes, sorry. Um, but we're going to be reading from Matthew 25, a famous story that Jesus told 
that illustrates what we just did. The master giving away some money. So let me pray for us, and then let me read this passage, and we'll see if the Lord has something to say to us today from his word. I believe he does, guys. If you just open your minds a little bit, I think God wants to speak to us today. By the way, if you're watching us at home, uh, there's a little thing under my ugly face there. Uh, you can click on and you can get that money form. We couldn't figure out a way to give you money online. So, sorry, you should have been here, all right? <laughs> I don't know what to say. Matthew 25, we'll start with verse 14. Jesus is talking, so this is from the word of our Lord and Savior, his lips. It will be like a man going on a journey who his servants, uh, who he called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, uh, to another one, and each one according to his ability. Then he went away. He would receive the five talents, went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also the one who had two talents made two talents more. But the one who received the one talent, he went and dug in the ground and he hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing the five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Let me pray for us today. God, I pray that right now we're holding money that's not even ours. And really that's a picture of our life. You've given us money that's not really ours. Um, we only think it is. And so today I pray that you would do what only you can do by your Holy Spirit. I cannot convict people. I cannot change hearts. But I believe this is a message that's changed my heart, and I want it to change all of our hearts. God, today would you speak to us about our money, the stuff you've given to us. And I pray that you would use your word. I pray that you would use the interviews and the inspiration of people in our church, testimonies. And that you would change us, make us a generous church. God, we want to be generous. So would you do that today, please? In Jesus' name, amen. It was a great story. You guys probably heard this story. A master comes to his servants, and he gives them each a little bit of money. Five talents, two talents, one talent. And a talent is just a measurement of money in the Bible times. In fact, uh, a talent, it, it represents 60 denarii. A denarius was one day's wage. So a talent is 60 days wages. So the guy that got five talents had almost 10 months wages handed to him. I want you to see something about the master. Let's just start off here. This is really remarkable. The master, representing God in this story, is generous. He's rich and he's generous. He's so rich that he gives money away to servants. These guys are literally the word slave is used there, doulos. And he gives away money. I want you to understand that God is a giving God. Psalm 24, 1 says, everything, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. In Haggai, Haggai 2, verse 8, it, God says, the silver and the gold are mine. So, so whose money are you holding right now that we just passed out? It's God's money. He owns it all, and here's the great thing about God. He does something unexpected. He says, here, I'm going to let you servants of mine have money. It's crazy. It's an incredible trust. It's an extravagant generosity for him to say to these servants. It's like you may be giving your junior high student $100,000. It's crazy, but it, sh it displays the generosity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I believe that God still is generous that he has everything under his control, and he has given us, particularly in this community of faith, a lot of money, and that he's taken care of us by being generous. Now, I just want to say before we get into this, because I'm going to talk to you personally about your money and what I think God wants you to do with your money, but I want to be very clear here from the very beginning, especially for those visiting, watching online, Jesus doesn't need your money. He's got tons of cash. He can get stuff anytime he wants, and this, this church doesn't need your money. I know you, you don't believe that, but guess what? For 63 years, we've been taking about offering every Sunday that's paid for everything we've done. So you know what we think? 
63 years from now, he'll still be taking care of what we need here at Eastview Christian Church, right? And so I don't need your money. The church doesn't need your money. This is not a guilt trip to make you give money to this church. It is a part of the redeeming, life-changing work and mission of the church that I'm calling you into today. That's what this, see, this master is saying, listen, I don't have to involve you. I'm already rich. I'm going on some vacation or trip. I've already got servants. I've got people taking care of my stuff. I don't need to give you money, but this great thing about God, he wants to involve us in his worldwide mission, and so he gives us money to invest in his name. Now, I know there are some of you who have worked really hard in here for the money that you have. You're a self-made man or a self-made woman. That's the phrase we use sometimes around here. And uh, maybe you got up earlier than other people, and you've been more conscientious, and you've made wiser business decisions But I would say to you, I want you to note something in this passage. In verse 15, he gives to each of these servants according to his ability. He knows the servant can handle five, the servant can handle two, the servant can handle one. Is it possible that you're successful in your business, you're successful in your line of work, you've been successful financially because God knew you had the capability of doing what you're doing right now with it? He already knew. I believe this with all my heart. Why do some people have more money and more acumen when it comes? The word acumen just came out of my mouth. Sweet. (laughs) Why do people have more wisdom and smarts when it comes to money than others? Because God knows that. Does it make you good or bad? Does it make you better than someone else? It just means that the Lord has entrusted more to you. Five talent servant guy and two talent servant guy, one's not better than the other. God's just entrusted to them based on what he knows they can do. So if you're successful here today, don't don't feel bad about that. The Lord knew that you would be successful with money. That's why he's given it to you. He knew that you could handle it. Uh, And that's the word here that I want us to look at uh, here in verse 14. He entrusted it to them. He literally handed it over to them. He gave gave it into their hands just like we've given to you today. We thought we could trust you. There's a lot of trust. Somebody in here has a $100 bill. That's a lot of trust. But we thought you could handle it for an hour and 15 minute long worship service. We could trust you with this. Okay? And God does the same way in a grateful way. So here's the deal. What is the point of this story? The point of the story is being faithful. That's the word. You, you guys know the rest of the story. I didn't read it. But the one servant, he did nothing with his money. He just grabbed it. He stuffed it in the ground. He was scared to do anything for the master. The other two, they put their money to work. They went and invested it. They did something with it. And, uh, and that's the word that we see in verses 21 and 23. Look, well done, good and faithful servant. I took five uh, money, monies of, of the master and I turned it into ten. I took two and I turned it into four. Well done. But what's the word? Why well done? Because you have been faithful. I can trust you. If I can trust you with five, I can trust you with more. If I can trust you with two, I can trust you with more. Well done, good and faithful servant. And that's the point of money. Can we be faithful with all that God has given to us and all the stuff that we have access to in, in um, the money and the jobs that we have. So today we're not just talking about money. We're giving you a chance to practically live this parable out. Okay? We've given everybody in here some money. You have an amount. I don't know what it is. We're not like God, so we could not predict who got what according to their ability. Okay? But we gave out fives, tens, twenties, fifties, hundred dollar bills. And we want you to put it to work for the next month. Okay, we want you to take that money and put it to work and earn something with it. And, uh, and then we want you to bring it back, whatever you have, plus whatever you earn. On June 3rd, we're going to take up a special offering. You've heard us talk today about our spring, our serve project. We do this every spring in June, right? And, uh, and we're going to take whatever's over the amount we passed out today, and we're going to put that towards the serve project. Okay? So it's going to go into our community. This is our chance to live out this parable. God gave us something. Remember, you came in the day. You didn't earn it, didn't deserve it, didn't ask for it. We just gave it to you. Now, tag, you're it. <laughs> you have to be faithful. Now, if you're here today and you're going, I'm visiting, I'm not playing this stupid game, just drop the money in the back 
in the offering, play, in the offering uh, boxes on the wall if you don't want to play. But I encourage you, I challenge you, I double dog dare you to put this into action, to live out this parable today. Because if you get it, if you take your 10 and turn it into 20, if you take your 50 and turn it into 200, then you're starting to understand what it's like to really have money that the Lord's given to us. Now, again, we've done this before for missions emphasis, um, I think two or three times since we've been here. What are some ideas? I just jotted some of the ones that people told me that they did before. Some people went and bought cake mixes and then sold, um, they sold cupcakes just out on the, on the corner of the street like kids sell lemonade. Like some people went and bought gasoline and they went and mowed a bunch of yards. So you can do this with your, your small group if you want to. Some people pooled money together and had a car wash for the surf project, and they did that. Some, some of you guys are crafty. Maybe you can do something crafty and you can sell it online. Maybe you're an investor. You take $100 and you invest it and bring back whatever's left. I don't know how God's going to let you be creative with this, um, but I'm challenging you. Take the money that you've been given today and do something with it for the next month and bring it back on June. Now, just listen. Don't do like when you sell your kids candy and you eat all the candy and then you just pay for it. Okay, don't do that. Okay? Uh, work at this. Let this be a, an illustration. Let that bill that you received when you came in today be an illustration of God entrusting, giving you something you didn't earn from a rich and generous God. And then say, oh, you want me to be involved in your kingdom, God? I will take this and I will work at it and I'll bring back even more. You can trust me. I will do something great with this. Well, uh, as you think about that, let me introduce you to someone who's very important to faithfully handing the money uh, here at Eastview Christian Church. God's given us a lot of money, and, um, and our guy is uh, Mark Zimmerman. He's our pastor of finance. Would you welcome him to the stage? We'll spend a little time with him. Hey, Mike. Good to see you. Yep. Mark has been with us for six and a half years. He uh, has got a degree from the University of Illinois in uh, finance and accounting. He comes from an executive finance background in real estate development. He's got a lovely wife, Rita, three kids. And, um, and Mark is the guy who cringes a little bit when I start talking about money. Because uh, he's a to-the-penny kind of guy, and I'm kind of like in the neighborhood kind of guy. <laughs> so when I give you numbers, they're pretty close. When he gives you numbers, they're to the penny, all right? We're both well-suited for our jobs, all right? You don't want me to be the accountant for Eastview Christian Church. But, uh, Mark, let's begin with this. Talk briefly about the measures we take here at Eastview. How can people, if they give money here, how can we trust that Eastview's handling that well? Sure, you know, we take stewarding God's resources very seriously. Mm -hmm. And our goal is that every dollar is going to impact uh, the kingdom of God for eternity. And so to that end, we have a really extensive budgeting process that includes all of our ministry directors, and I've got a fantastic uh, accounting team behind me. Yes. And then we uh, have our financials reviewed regularly by the elders, by our financial advisory team. We also submit to an annual audit every year with a national accounting firm. And we uh, stay accredited with the ECFA. So just ways that we want to demonstrate our faithfulness. We try, to, we try to take very seriously the fact when, you know, I gave you a 5 or a 10 or a 50 today, the Lord gives us about $10.5 million this year, Lord willing. And we take that very seriously. It's a trust that we have. And uh, so we work really hard, and Mark and his team work really hard. Um, but you're also a pa you're passionate not just about counting the money, <laughs> but about people being intentional in giving and generosity. Mm -hmm. And when we were together, you talked about um, comparing that to, like, when you want to go on a diet. So tell me about yeah, that. You know, I think that <laughs> there's a general tendency for people to complicate uh, financial management, and they, it it's, it's makes it more difficult to sometimes get started. And so I think it's really easy to compare that to something we can all relate to, which is uh, sometimes being overweight or being on a diet. You know, financial, or excuse me, from a physical standpoint, if you consume more calories than you burn, you're going to gain it's weight. It's right. bad. Yeah, it's right. And uh, we all know what that can be like. Financially speaking, if we spend more than we earn, we know we're going to go into debt. We're going to have financial struggles. And so the idea is how do we use some of that simple knowledge and apply it to other areas of our life? And I think it works really well with looking at physical health versus financial health. And so I, I kind of came up with four simple uh, just practices that, that you keep in mind. The first thing to do is, is to evaluate where you're at. You know, every day we get up in the morning, we look in the mirror, and we can tell whether we're gaining weight or losing weight. You know, you get a really good visual on, on where you're, you're at there. So financially, we need to look and see what, what resources has God entrusted to us. And um, uh, do we need to get out of debt? Do we need to make some changes? The second thing is to establish where you want to be. You've got to set goals. So if you want to 
lose 15 pounds, you need to establish that. If you want to uh, get out of debt or you want to create margin for generosity in your life, mm -hmm. you got to make some changes to do that. And the third thing is coming up with a plan. And, you know, when we talk about our physical health, that would be a diet, for instance, or, yep. you know, starting to exercise more. Financially, we've got to set a budget and set some plans on how uh, we're going to accomplish those goals. And then the fourth thing is just to put it into action. That's really the discipline part. That's probably the hardest part. Mm -hmm. But it's putting it into action and uh, evaluating where you're at and then constantly hitting repeat. You know, we, we think about whether you're a 22-year-old coming out of college or you're 65 looking at retirement, these four steps are something you're going to do hundreds of over times over, over, over your right. entire life. Just like you start diets over and over, over. and over again, right? <laughs> and uh, the thing is to, to think about that and to keep going when you set those goals. Well, Mark, I'm, I want you to talk a little bit about this, The Treasure Principle sure. by Randy Alcorn. It's a book you recommended and you like. Why do you like so much about this book? I, I think this is a fantastic resource for, for Christians who are looking at the why, the heart behind why God wants us to steward resources well, mm -hmm. what he wants us to do with those resources. And uh, very few books do it quite as well as this one. And the, it doesn't hurt that this is only about 100 pages, so it's really right. easy to Even get guys into. can read this. Yeah, it's, it's, a yeah. Quick, it's a quick read. And I know that there's a number of members here that have actually read this book before. I would encourage you to reread it mm -hmm. because uh, you'll be encouraged and challenged uh, again and again mm -hmm. with this book. And it's just a good reminder uh, of the heart behind why we want to live a generous lifestyle. Mark, thanks for what you do here. Let's uh, give it up for Mark Zimmerman. Okay. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Thank you. If you guys, um, if, if, if I really, we want to have this resource in your hands. So this, this book, The Treasure Principle, we have copies. I went together with the small groups uh, department and my budget, and we've provided copies of this book free for you, for every family. If you go and get to, uh, go to the uh, info centers today, you can pick one up and say, hey, I, I would like the treasure principle. We want you to have it. We want you to read it. It's a simple read that really helps understand and explain what it means to hold the treasure that God has given to us. So that's a resource that we offer for you. In fact, later on this card, you can check, I'm going to read the treasured principle. We hope that everybody either has or will do that when it comes time. Well, okay, so... Um, if money's a gift from God, he's given us money, um, then what's the problem with money? Why is it such an issue in our culture? What, what is the deal with money? And it, it probably goes to one of those things you've probably heard before, wrongly quoted from the Bible, by the way, from 1 Timothy 6. That's where we're going to next. You've probably heard somebody say, money is the root of all evil. Right? Now, look at your bills that I, what we gave you this morning. Look at them. Do they look, they look good or evil? There's, there's nothing evil or good about that. It's just a green piece of paper. Money is amoral. There's no morals attached to it. It's neither good or bad. But what we're going to see today is that it can become moral if you fall in love with it. So we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Here we go, verse 6. Let me begin with this encouragement. 1 Timothy 6, 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Money is not the problem. The problem is the love of money. Let me just illustrate this morning uh, the problem that we have in the United States with money. Okay? These are statistics I've just studied in the last three or four months. 62% of people in America are stressed about money. Nearly two-thirds of the people in here right now, you're, you're experiencing some kind of stress because of money. 54% uh, of people in here if you guys are like the rest of the country, you spend more than you make. You can see that this is not going to end well. Now you're spending more than we make, and that's common. 70% live paycheck to paycheck. See how common that is. Uh, 77 to 80% have credit card debt. 56% of divorces cite money as the reason for divorce. We got an issue, right? And then this is a Christian stat at the beginning. Uh, American Christians give on average about 2 to 3% of their income. So what happens? Where's the disconnect? This money's become a problem. It's a gift from God. He gave it to us. He entrusted it to us. We're supposed to use it for his glory. 
but it becomes trouble and all these things result. We end up not giving God anything and spending on all these other things. What's the problem? And I can see some of you right now, you have guilty looks on your faces. This is not a guilt trip. This, isn't, this is not like, you bad people fix it. This is, come on guys, let's go. That's what this sermon's about. That's what this day is about. Don't feel guilty. We'll talk about that later. But you should feel guilty about this. If you're in love with money, it's going to end poorly. The root of evil, according to the scripture, and again, this is the Apostle Paul talking directly about money to rich people. Look what it says there in verse 9. You desire to be rich. It's the love of money that causes this. Literally, philos, aguria. The philaguria is the love of silver. We love silver. We love money, and when you love money, eventually you're going to desire to have more. The problem with falling in love with money is love, money doesn't fall in love back. <laughs> it leads to all kinds of bad things. When you, when you fall in love with money, then this desire to be rich, the word rich simply means an abundance, to have more than you need. So if you, how, how many shirts do you need? How many pairs of shoes do you need? How many coats do you need? How, how many cars do you need? How many video games you need how much do you need if you have more than you need then you're rich okay I, I want to show you something in case you think Paul doesn't know what he's talking about uh, about six years ago Sarah and I went uh, with another group from Eastview we went to Ephesus where this letter was written remember Timothy is the pastor in Ephesus uh, what they've uncovered there are the first century terraced houses these are mansions. We're standing, that one in the middle is a picture looking down into a foyer of a first century home. People lived, think of Beverly Hills, think of the Hamptons, okay? These were rich people up on a hill with a view. Look at these really incredible mosaics that have lasted from the first century. These were rich people. So when Paul's writing to Timothy saying, hey, the desire to be rich is going to become an issue, he knows there's people in Ephesus who are rich. In fact, a very wealthy city. And so this desire to be rich is not just something that happens for us. 2,000 years ago, people in Ephesus were dealing with it. And the problem about desiring riches, listen to this, the problem is, is that you'll never be rich enough. If the desire is to get rich, you'll never have enough. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon may be the richest man in human history. He's by far the Bill Gates of his day. It says there, he who loves money will never have money enough. Everybody in here has a number. You all have a number. If you're younger, you have a smaller number. If you're older, you have a bigger number. There's a number that says, if I could just get this much money, my life would be good. For some of you, it's $1,000. Some of you, it's $50,000. Some of you, it's $100,000. Some of it's $10 million. But here's the aha. No matter what you want right now, no matter what your number is, if you had it, you'd want more. It wouldn't be enough. And this appetite leads us to this thing called materialism. The needless accumulation of stuff in our lives. And we have to confess. I'm confessing to you. Okay, I have this addiction to more stuff. It's called materialism and we have to address it. We just accumulate stuff for stuff's sakes. Listen, we're exposed to 3,000 commercials every day. And every one of them are targeted strategically to get us to buy stuff we don't need. Raise your hand if you've ever bought something you don't need. Of course, you've been to Walmart. Everybody has. And if you don't think they're not completely strategic in everything they do, they know what people buy the most. So they place it at the other end of the store. You ever go to buy milk at Walmart? It's in the back. By the time you get back to the milk section, you're holding a lawn chair and a lamp and a pair of shoes. <laughs> you got an ISU Red, Redbirds t-shirt on. You just came from milk. And then you get to the checkout counter, and, and of course they know they've got these little gadgety things. Of course you now need a keychain with a light on it. <laughs> Have you been to Walmart? It costs $67 for a gallon of milk. <laughs> because that's what they do. They're designed to get you to buy stuff you don't need. And when you desire to be rich, it leads to materialism. They do the same thing in commercials. Commercials contrast cool, good-looking people with blatantly nerdy and undesirable people. You're this if you don't buy the product. You're cool if you do. And, uh, and this, it's the culture we live in, and this form of love of money is subtle. 
because it deals with stuff we need. I'll confess to you, I've told you this before, I grew up super, super poor. One pair of pants at Walmart every year, that's what we lived on. It was Kmart back then, but that's kind of out now. Uh, but that's what we had. So I have, a, I have an issue with clothes. I want more clothes. And the thing about it is, you need clothes. And as a pastor, I justify the fact that I'm going to be in front of a bunch of people all the time, so I need to buy more clothes. I got too many clothes. I'll just tell you, I got too many clothes. Amen from my wife. There it is. <laughs> I've got it bad. I'm not going to deny it. That's my confession today. But the problem with this desire to be rich, never enough, materialistic thinking, buying more and more and more, is that sometimes that leads us to get into debt. We buy stuff that we think we need more of with money we don't have. And that's a major deal in our culture. Listen, two things I want to say before we address this serious issue of debt. Number one, debt is not a matter of sin according to the Bible. It's a matter of wisdom. Okay, there, it, most of us in here have, you know, houses that we're paying for. It's not a sin, okay, but it's wise. There are unwise debts and there are, there are uh, super dumb debts, right? And then there are okay debts. You can manage it, right? Um, still, debt, debt has a tendency to, to lock us in. Many people believe that they can't give to the church, they can't give to God's cause because they're in debt and they're making payments and they can't afford it. I want to encourage you today when it comes time to check on this card and say, hey, I want to talk to somebody to help me with my stewardship and making a plan to get out of debt. If you have debt today, even serious debt, I want you just to understand you're not alone. Even the smartest, richest um, financial people in here who are doing very well off because they've, they've lived long enough to get there, they were in debt one time. I don't know very many people who have never had a debt. Okay, so just be <laughs> where you're at and try to move forward as the Lord leads us. Now, the problem with all of this debt and all of this is a downward spiral. You see this, you desire to get rich, you fall into temptation, you get into a snare. That word snare literally means trap or noose, so there's the debt part. And you fall into senseless and harmless desires that plunge people to destruction. Even in verse 10 where it says, you cause, it causes some to wander from the faith. Unchecked, the desire for riches and the love of money will lead to greed and selfishness. So that money that I gave you on the, on the way in today, we start to look at our money not as a gift from God to invest in his kingdom. We look at it as a gift from God for us to spend on us. And once you turn that inward, it becomes selfish and greedy. And, and that's the reality of our culture. And so what's the antidote for this? The antidote is contentment. You want to be rich? Look at what Paul says. Godliness with contentment is great gain. If we have food and clothes, verse 8, with these we'll be content. You can get rich right now. Just be content with what you have. And you're rich. Say, I don't need anything else. You're rich. I'm content with what God's given to me. And if you, and Paul says in verse 6, see that word great gain? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Porismos is the word. It literally means a return on investment. He says, you want to return on your investment? You want to invest wisely? Be content with what you have, and you will have an eternal investment return. He's talking about riches. You can be rich today in Jesus Christ. He says, you brought nothing into the world, you'll take nothing out. So invest in something other than earth stock. Invest in something that is eternal. And don't keep desiring more. Here's the aha. We're going to get to this in just a moment. Giving is the most tangible way to express contentment. I want you to hear this. Giving is the way that we can express, I've got enough, I'm going to give some away. And um, we're going to get to that in just a moment. What do we do now? That we, know, we know that this is a problem. But first I want to say something more about this topic of debt. Um, because um, in a moment we're going to hear a war story from uh, one of our families in the church about how they got out of debt. But Today, the most important thing we want to do right now is celebrate the debt that we don't owe. We do this every Sunday. We have the communion table spread up here, and we pass out these emblems. The ushers are going to come in just a moment. You take these two cups. One symbolizes the body of Christ, the other the blood of Christ. Hold on to those, and we'll take. But communion is a representation. It says to us that we had this debt of sin. All the bad we've ever done, all the thoughts we've ever thought, all the mistakes we've ever made, um, it was a, an incredible debt. In fact, Jesus tells a parable 
about a man who was so in debt. It represented millions of dollars. And he fell down and he begged for the master to forgive him. And the master said, your debt's clear. Can you imagine what would happen if, if I could just get into all of your financial accounts today, all of your affairs, and whatever you owed for your car, your home, your debt, your credit, whatever, I just go, let's wipe that away. Uh, that's what Jesus did on the cross. That's what he did with his death and his burial and his resurrection. He broke his body so that we could no longer be in debt. He poured out his blood so we could no longer be in debt. Not the debt of money, the debt of sin. And now we stand clean before the Father, debt free, because of this gift. Let's think about the debt of sin as the ushers come and pass out the emblems and then I'll come back and we'll take together. The word of God says that the wages of sin is death. We owe it. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For God so loved the world, he gave. And so we celebrate that gift, Jesus Christ, his son, who paid our debt that we could never pay. We celebrate the body of Christ broken for us. Let's celebrate together, church. celebrate the blood of Christ shed for us so that we could be sin free. Let's celebrate the blood of Christ. God, we thank you that um, you have taken a debt away that we could never repay. You forgave it, washed it clean, took it off the records so that we could be free. So teach us, Lord, about debt even now for the rest of this time. And uh, help us to be better stewards of what you've given us freely. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we get a chance to hear a really cool story from a couple in our church about debt. Hope it's inspiring to you. I hope you pay attention to this story. Hey, ESP family, um, we're really excited uh, today to interview um, actually somebody who's on our staff, Isaiah and Amy Lockard. And he's the guy that's always behind the scenes and doing uh, tech stuff here in the auditorium. But um, I want to share with you guys, um, or have you guys share with the congregation, uh, your story. We're talking about debt. And um, what's cool about this is that what you're going to talk about, at least 80 to 85 percent of the audience is dealing with. We were, we were pretty normal. I mean, uh, I got a credit card when I turned 18 so I could build credit and for emergencies, of yep. course. Yep. And, um, Emergency it, pizzas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it immediately became, you know, like the cash cow, like let me go get some, some of this or some of that that I can't afford and then uh, figure out how to pay for it later. And then um, she didn't have any, any credit cards, but mm -hmm. we both had school loans, which we never really thought twice about. It was just kind of normal. Uh, after school? Or mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah, right after I graduated okay. college. And then uh, from there, you know, we decided to buy a brand new car. And I had already bought a car I couldn't afford, and then we bought another one, yeah. so why not? Um, and then... A, a big expense was when I started grad school. Again, it was something that we didn't even think twice about. Right. And grad school can be quite pricey, so... But we didn't even... We never even talked about how much it would cost. I just enrolled, I got accepted, and we started that journey. Most, for the loan. most of you guys, uh, most of people listening to you guys today are going, yeah, you go to college, you get loans. It's yeah. kind of the way it happens, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. So you've been married how long now at this point? 10 years. Uh, yes, 10 years. 10 years. And then you find yourself with, can you give me a number? How, how big was the debt at its very... At its worst, it was 130000 130, And that's 000. not including a house or anything right. like that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time, you told me that there was a time where it, you guys kind of knew this, this was heavy. But you also had this spiritual thing about tithing and giving. Tell, tell how that played into kind of the initial turnaround for you guys. Yeah. We, uh, I was stressed constantly because I just felt that we were um, trapped with our finances. Yeah. We, we wanted nice things. We wanted to continue to be able to do things and have fun. But we were also kind of looking forward to um, are we in the careers that, that God wants us to be in? And, um, and can we change? Yeah. careers because we're we're locked in we need the salaries you we're earning salaries to keep it going yeah. yeah and so i was super stressed about it and i think the real turning point for us was when um it, it wasn't a uh 180 so to speak but we just really felt like and, and i felt like god was telling us we need to start giving yeah. and um that didn't make a lot of sense because we didn't have any extra money <laughs> 
But uh, it represented, I think, the beginning of a heart change for me mm. of trust, yeah. where I was no longer taking the burden on myself, but we were saying together, this is a priority for us, this is something God has called us to, and we trust that, uh, that he'll provide for us yeah. even as we, we take this step. To me, when he you know, took that, it had that interest in tithing, I was relieved, really, and I felt like immediately we saw that God was faithful because at that point we were living in New York and we had a really tight budget situation when all this was going on and we didn't think that, that we were going to make it the next month with, with our budget. Um, and right when that was going on, he got a promotion. And then it happened again where the budget was tight. And we were she like, lost her job first. Yes, right. and I, I, I got lost her job. She tied and said, yes. God's going to bless us, then I lost my job. <laughs> exactly. That's sometimes the way it works. Yes. But then you got two successive raises, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. promotions. Yeah. It's fantastic. Incredible. Yeah. So you guys, so I love this. It's beautiful because you decide we're going to do, do the God thing first. We're going to be spiritual uh, priorities. But then you go, okay, now we get this debt to tackle. So how did you guys start tackling the debt and getting it down? I mean, the first thing that happened, honestly, is we, um, that kind of trust turned into us trusting God with our careers yeah. and going, you know, I knew I needed to make a career change and that was God was calling me into the line of work I'm in now. Yeah, I'm um, glad you did. Yeah, <laughs> and so we just made the decision to, to move forward with that and we ended up moving out of New York and, and getting a job in that. And in the midst of all that, thinking about starting a family, feeling still some discouragement of just the weight of that debt that was hanging over our heads, what remained of that. Um, we just decided we were done. Yeah. Like we just had to be done. We were gonna get out of debt. We had been living on a budget, so it wasn't like month to month we were just straining and trying to figure out how we were gonna buy food, but nothing was happening with the debt. Right. It was minimum payments, mm -hmm. it was still all of that. And so we finally just turned the corner and said, this got to be done. It's just gotta be done. And, and God lead us into being free of it. Yeah. So what are the sacrifices that some of the sacrifices you made to, to you prioritize, I'm gonna get out of debt? Well, I, our budget was stripped down for years and years. <laughs> we would laugh to ourselves that we hadn't bought new clothes in forever. I had holes with uh, socks with, with holes in right, them and right. my mom would be like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> you know, and eating out was just non-existent. Maybe once a month. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and people, you know, definitely were thought, thought that we were crazy or making interesting choices. We sold our cars and I got a free car from my parents that was just the a, worst. Like a right, drunker, yeah. But yeah, that's it great, was, that's yeah. great. So you're not buying new cars, you're not buying new clothes, mm -hmm. you're not eating out a lot. You're saving a lot of money just doing that, right? The big thing was extra work. Okay. And we sacrificed a lot of time. Um, we sold a lot of stuff. We, I, I took on, I mean, hours a week of extra work. Yeah. And um, God was really faithful in that as well. And we had a goal. Um, we kind of said, hey, by fall of 2016, we think we can have this done. Right. And it was about two and a half years from us really getting crazy about the debt. And every month that I would get discouraged because we weren't gonna hit our goal for that month, mm -hmm. like a check would show up. Yeah, yeah. I agree, yeah. I think it was crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and, and it just seeing your emotion there is like, that's a cool victory, right, mm -hmm. that God gives you there. Yeah. Uh, and so you guys did Financial Peace University. Mm -hmm. Did you find that to be helpful? Did you do that with the oh, group? Yes. And yeah, well, we did it when we first got married. Okay. And in theory, we wanted to continue with it. We did start budgeting, but that, but we really didn't get, you know, intense with following like kind of Dave Ramsey's right. principles until we had been married probably six years or, or mm -hmm. something. And once we started doing that, I mean, it was, it was great from from there. I, I would really recommend that to to anyone. And so now you guys, all these years later, you're debt free. And how, uh, here's what I just want you to tell. I want you to just kind of talk to the people of Eastview and go, here's what it feels like to be debt free. How does that feel? I mean, we were not created to be slaves. Right. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the, the Bible says the borrower is slave to the lender. Yeah. And that's so true. And a lot of people don't realize it. I mean, the common wisdom these days is that you, you want something, if you can afford the payments, and get it, do it, it right, and right. you can have it. Right. And I think that there's a lot of sort of discipline and obedience that's missing from that equation. Yep. And so for us, we just feel like, you know, all the times we talked about what, what can we do when we have money to spend when we don't have payments. And it was all about like, 
really good things like giving mm -hmm. and being able to um, care for our children and provide them with experiences and things like that. Generosity toward family yeah. and friends. Yeah. We used to look at somebody who had a really nice car and be like, oh, that'd be sweet. And now I look over at that person and I, I just hope. They're probably in debt. I, well, I, well, I hope yes. they're not. I hope they're okay. Right, but right. They're, but it you just kind changes. of worry about them almost. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I hope you're okay. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Because it is a lot of pressure. Yes. Listen, Amy and Isaiah, thank you so much for sharing your story because I know that, again, 80% of people that are, that are watching us right now are dealing with some kind of debt. And the freedom to be out from under it and the freedom to be able to give is the blessing of it all. So God bless you guys and thanks for sharing with us. Thank you. Thanks. Amen. Amen. Listen, I, I hope you're inspired on so many levels with that. If you feel like you're in over your head, they were in over their head. If you feel like you need a tool, um, we're offering one of the things you can check on your card today is I'm interested in Financial Peace University. It's a very practical way to try to figure out your debt and how to get out. Guys, listen, uh, once again, if you have debt, that's not a sin. But if you're in over your head and it stifles you from giving, then guess what? That's a problem. And so uh, this uh, Financial Peace University and uh, Dave Ramsey has been very instrumental. A lot of people getting debt free. We offer that here at Eastview Christian Church. We'd love for you to be a part of it. And, um, and again, uh, just take some steps to, to work on this debtedness, indebtedness that we have. Well, one more look at the Bible this morning, and we'll be in 1 Timothy 6 still. So I hope you're still there. And again, this is the word of the Lord. You know, you think that God doesn't have a whole lot to say about money, but actually the words we have recorded from Jesus, he talks more about money than heaven and hell. He talks more about money than just about any other topic that there is because he knows the reality. So here's, here's where we're at today. If it all belongs to God and all that we have has been given to us, and if falling in love with money and really... Uh, that really is a thing that's going to take us down a path that leads to evil. And if we're going to answer someday, God's going to come back and say, hey, what would you do with all the cash I gave you? Then what should we do with the money that we have? Well, let's go to 1 Timothy 6 because, again, Paul addresses the rich. Again, the rich people that lived in this rich town called Ephesus, a lot like Bloomington Normal, all right? Look in verse 17. As for the rich in this, in this present age, now I want to stop there for just a moment. Okay, because I think when we read the Bible, we just assign certain you know mental uh, realities to those things. When I say as for the rich, most of you in here are going, that's not me. That's somebody else. You've got a name. You got somebody else you're thinking about that's rich. And I want to convince you this morning that you're rich. I just, I just want to convince you that you are. Most of us read the statement uh, for those who are rich. You're going, oh, I'm not rich. So and so is rich. I'm not rich. But I want to challenge that notion today. Even if you have your your uh, handheld devices with you right now, you can go to a, a website that will freak you out. It's called globalrichlist.com. Globalrichlist.com. If you're watching at home, try this. If you want to try it right now, try it real quickly. And you just punch in your income, and it will tell you where you rank in the world. In terms of riches, I promise you that everyone in here right now is rich. It, it, it will humble you when you find out your world ranking. This will give you an example. A kid making $25 a week is richer than half the world. I mean, think about that. Three and a half plus billion people are poorer than a kid in America that makes $25 a week. So just get ready to be convicted. When I read, as for the rich in this present age, I'm talking about you and me. Most of us in here, if we make the median salary of Bloomington Normal, which is $65,000 a year, you're richer than 99% of the world. Think about that. That's staggering. So we need to pay attention when, when Paul writes, as for the rich in the present age, he's not talking about somebody else. He's talking about Mike. He's talking about you. What's he have to say to the rich in this present world? Well, let's go on. Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. What a great, I'm going to pray. I just need to, God, would you, would you speak to us right now? Speak to us rich people. Tell us what you want us to do with your money. We want to get better at this. We want to advance your kingdom. We want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. 
God, move by your spirit now in these words. In Jesus' name, amen. And the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to switch what we put our hope and our treasure in. If we really want to get right with our money and what God's given to us, we have to put our hope in something other than this world. See what he says there? He says, tell the rich people, don't, to put, don't, don't, to, don't put their hopes in the uncertainty of riches. Some of you can testify in the last six months to a year, you've lost money, you've lost a job, you've lost wages, you've lost an income. Guess what? If you put your hope in that, you're in trouble because it goes. Proverbs says, cast but a glance at riches and they fly away like a bird. <laughs> That's truth. You can't count on it. You can't count on it being there no matter how much you have. But we can place our hope in something that will last forever. Put your hope not on the uncertainty of riches, look at verse 17, but on God. And to do this, we have to take our hope from, from what the world says is important with our money, and we have to place it on something eternal. We can't just say it, guys, because I know that most of us in here, we all agree, yes, heaven's forever, the earth is temporary, we shouldn't invest in the earth, we should invest in heaven but there's got to be a tangible way of expressing this reality, a, dis a discipline that we can come back to over and over and over again. And I believe from the beginning, God designed a way for us to constantly remind ourselves, it's not about here, it's about there. And that way is tithing. From the very beginning, before the law was established, Abraham, Father Abraham himself tithed. A tithe is simply 10%. It's a simple concept to God. You have a bunch of, you, your, your cattle are, are fertile and you have some cows, give me the first uh, one-tenth of your cows. You have a great crop, give me one-tenth of your crop. You bring them to the house of the Lord. Leviticus 27.30 says this, every tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the land, is the Lord. So let's listen to this. 10% of all that God has given us is to be given back to him. Malachi 3.10 says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. And this is what God, God says, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. I will open, will I not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need? So here we go. He wants a tenth of everything. It's his. Bring it into my house, and I'll bless you. And then finally, Proverbs 3.9 talks about the priority. Honor the Lord with your wealth. And when the first fruits of all your produce, one of, the, one of the things about tithing in the Old Testament, God's saying, don't give me the leftover 10%, give me the first 10%. Give me the first fruits. And so this idea of tithing, now some of you are saying, well, what about those of us who are in the New Testament? You'll notice that today in the parking lot, we didn't bring in a bunch of goats for sacrifice or cows. It would be really, really hectic out there and a really lousy job parking. And you might step in something on the way in. Right? Luckily, we don't have to bring sacrifices like animals or, or grains and stuff like that. But are we still held to the tithe standard in the Bible? Because we're past Malachi. We're in the New Testament in Jesus' grace. Are we still held to the tithe? And some have argued the tithe is required by the law no longer applies to us because we're not under the law. We're under grace. I think you're right. If I would say it this way, you're no longer under 10% goes to God. You're under 100% goes to God because the grace of Jesus has saved us from our sins. Now we owe him everything. He doesn't want 10%. That's not discipleship. He wants 100% of everything we have all the time. And so, um, you know, do we have to tithe is not the question. The question is, how can I express my gratitude for all that God has freely entrusted to me so that I can enhance his kingdom and advance his kingdom. See, we live out this teaching in verses 17 and 19 here. I want you to see it again. We, we don't set our hope on the uncertainty of riches, but look at 19. We store up treasures as, for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Both of these passages today we've read from Matthew 25 and 1 Timothy 6 is talking about the future, God's coming back. There's another place besides this world. So we store up for something in the future. Jesus said this way in Matthew 6, don't lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break in and steal. Rather, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither rust nor moth nor thief can steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now listen, I'm fully aware that many of you in here today are skeptical about what I'm telling you about the tithe. 
okay, that you don't think you have to give 10% to the church. Some of you are not just skeptics, you're Christian skeptics. <laughs> because uh, you, you say in your mind, tithing to the church is not the same as giving to the temple. It's a different thing. And uh, I believe there are other ways to give to God. And I encourage you to give to other organizations that, that advance the kingdom of God, other parachurch organizations, and many of us do. But I think I can make a very compelling argument from the scripture that you should bring at least 10% of your income to the church. Um, I think the church is the household of faith. It's called that in Galatians 6.10. I think we as saints make up the household of God, Ephesians 2.19. In 1 Timothy 3.15, the household of God is called the church of the living God. If we took the tithes to the house in the Old Testament, we should take the tithes to the house in the New Testament. That's what God's calling us to. And I'll give you some biblical reasons that I think you should give 10% of your income to the local church. Again, if you're visiting or you're watching online and you think we're all about money, we want your money, keep your money. This is for followers of Jesus Christ who want to become better disciples. I believe we should be giving a tenth. Number one, I think it's the place of worship and growing in God. If you go here and you grow here, you should give here. It's just practical. You, you know what they used all the gifts for in the Old Testament? For the priest to eat, for the priest to have celebrations and to have food, for us to do sacrifices. It was very practical. We need more to sacrifice. I've heard some people say, this is crazy to me. I've heard this over 33 years. Some people go to church and go, I don't trust the leaders of my church and how they invest that money. I'm like, why do you go to that church then? I, I would not go to a church that I don't trust people handling money. It's hilarious. So you, you trust us with your kids down the hallway, the high school students, the junior high students. You trust us raising your children in the Lord. You trust me giving you wisdom from God every week from the word of God. But nah, I'm not giving them money. I don't trust them. I, I think that's probably a cop-out. Okay? And I think God wants us to bring our tithe into the storehouse. I think it's also a place to invest in God's worldwide mission. It, it's the best place. The church is the mission. It's what God established. It's not my idea. The church, and this is the local representation of the church. It's Eastview Christian Church. And this is the mission of God for us in the world. And I know when you give a tithe or an offering, especially the younger generation, you feel so much better if it goes to some orphans and we rescue orphans. You feel so much better if you're saving some women out of the sex slave trade and we do that. It feels so much better if you're digging a well in a foreign country, and we do that. It feels so much better if you give money so you can clothe and educate and, and feed kids, and we do that. To the tune of almost a million dollars above and beyond our budget last year, we've given a million dollars out to all kinds of social causes. And yeah, you can clap for that. So if people ever ask you, what, is, what are they doing with all the money at Eastview? We're giving it away. We're, we're advancing the kingdom of God throughout the world. But I want to give you a twist on this. Because most of you in here, if I say, hey, guys, give everything. Give your tithe. Because we're going to put some new light bulbs in the auditorium. <laughs> we're going to buy better goldfish for the nursery. Not real goldfish, the ones you eat. We're going to hire quality goldfish. You're not going to get excited about that offering. But I, I can tell you that every dime spent by God's church in God's name for God's glory is holy. I believe these lights in here are holy. Some of you are in dark patches. You see, we're replacing the lights in here. Why is that? So you can see the word of God when we read it. So you can see one another when we worship. These lights may not be a big deal to you, but they're holy. Because they function as the, as, as the church of God as we study and we grow together. Guys, listen, every dime you give to the church in the name of God is for the kingdom of God. And finally, it's the place you can give without receiving something in return. I believe this about, about giving an offering and giving a tenth to the church. It's the only gift in the world that I can give and get no credit for it. I, I don't get any, we don't publish names of top givers. If you're a top giver, I don't even know who you are, okay? I don't know, I don't know any, the names of anybody, okay? We don't say, yay, you gave more, we, we esteem you. It's not like charities. A lot of times you give to a charity, you give to some cause, you get credit back for it. This is clean, man. You just give it to the church, you walk away. That's for God. Nobody gives me credit. I love that part of giving to the church. And uh, if you're here and you're convinced as a Christian that we've got some work to do, uh, here at Eastview Christian Church. I want to show you something. We did this last fall. We took this poll. Uh, remember we did the RUN, spiritual formation test. We're going to do it again next January as an all-church um, 
you know, day of uh, vision. But I want you to see that, you know, in some regards, we're doing pretty good. Probably higher than the national average, 30% of our church, uh, we give a tithe or more. Okay? But we got some work to do here. Because some people are stuck here between 2 and 10%. Some here are under 2%. Now, again, I don't know, but this is, this is not my answers. You guys filled these out. <laughs> so this is us saying this is us, right? Some people give when they think about it. Um, some people have never given. Can I just challenge us all to take a step here? If you've never given, start giving. If you give when you think about it, think about it more, right? If you give regularly but less than 2, increase that to 10. If you're between 2 and 10, increase that to 10. And if you're up here, guess what? Give more, because you've got more. God is calling us all. He's calling us all to be faithful to his church by giving more than we've ever. If you're a Christian here today, though, and you're still not convinced, I'm just going to let you off the spiritual hook. Don't give a dime to Eastview Christian Church. Okay? Give 10% to something else that will advance the kingdom of God. Okay? I suspect you don't want to give a tenth to Eastview because you don't want to give a tenth. And that's, that's, just, that's just my fatherly, just saying, hey, guys, gently as I can, let's just talk about how willing we are to give. And if you go to this church and you're a part of this mission that we, God's called us to in this vision, then I want to encourage you to give. Now, if you're a non-Christian skeptic, if you're not a believer, and you're, you're here today going, there's something fishy here. He's trying to scam us. Let me say this again. Keep the money you receive today as a gift. You can spend it on whatever you want. Okay? You're probably going to have really big guilt feelings if you do that. But if you do, if that's what you want, you want that's from the Holy Spirit. That's not from me. Okay? You'll be eating that steak and the Holy Spirit like, man, you are a loser. But that's the Holy Spirit. Okay? I hope you see that I'm joking with you. If you're here today and you've got money, free cash, take it and spend it on yourself. I don't care. What we really care for you, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, is that you receive the free gift of God that he gave us through Jesus. That's what we want for you. Amen? And so if you're here today, keep the money, go to the family room. We want to talk to you about a gift that will change every way that you perceive your money. See, I believe strongly that as your pastor, I should lead by example. I tell you to pray because I pray. And I tell you to be in the Word of God because I'm in the Word of God. And I think it's important for me to share. And again, please don't, this is not bragging, it's not that impressive. But I want you to know that as a pastor, my wife Sarah and I, we are committed to giving. I'm not just telling you this. And we started tithing 33 years ago when we were married. It's a lot less than it is now. And in fact, now I can tell you that 33 years later, we're giving almost 15% of our salary to the church here. And um, it used to be with check writing. And we have this thing. And if you're old school church like me, the plates are passed every week and you want to participate as a part of worship, right? But that's kind of changed now because very few people write checks anymore. And so how did I get to the place where I'm like, okay, I'm comfortable with just giving online or giving before anything comes out. Here's where, I, here's where I've landed. Because Sarah and I got to this crazy place where we were writing four checks for every service, splitting up our tithe and like putting it in. It's like, so people would go, you, you know how people look at you like, oh, you put nothing in. Hmm. <laughs> right? You guys know how that works? Been there, done that, right? We've all been there. But what I want to encourage you today is what Sarah and I came to is we understood, we like, listen, if that first fruits thing is, if the first 10% or whatever we're giving is actually God's, then we can give it electronically, and we don't even see it. It's not even ours. We just send it to him immediately. So if you have not done this online giving thing, go to our app or go to online. I, think, I don't think you can set up an ongoing on the app, but you can online, and you can just have money coming out. Almost 45% of our church gives this way. And it's holy. It's okay. I know it doesn't feel very worshipful. We'll always talk about giving on Sunday mornings. We'll have a moment where we talk about giving. But maybe someday we won't pass the plates because we'll all be giving online because we'll have that priority. I want to encourage you that. Sarah and I have made it a point to try to be as generous as possible with our giving. And that's what this whole thing's about. Guys, it's not about, it's not about paying God. It's not about paying God off. It's not about making God think you're better than somebody else. All those are wrong reasons to give an offering. You know why you give an offering? Because it teaches us generosity. 
I, I want you to see that. What, here's what happens. Verse 18, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. I'm just telling you, the more you give, the more generous you're going to get. And the more you're going to want to give. And you, what you're going to be surprised by is you're going to start giving money away and it's going to bring you more joy. What did, the, what did Jesus say about the servants in Matthew 25? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. Enter into your master's what? Joy. Because it's fun to give for the cause of Jesus Christ. It's what he says here in ver- chapter 6, verse 6. Godliness, godliness with contentment and richly providing us everything to enjoy, verse 17. Taking hold of that which is truly life, verse 19. Guys, you develop generosity, and this is what God is telling rich people to do with their money. I want us to become a generous church. I don't want us to become a tithing church. I don't want us to become a rich church. I want us to be known in this community as the most generous people you can meet because we just want to give you more. And I believe by the grace of God, we're becoming that. I'm going to tell you a story that happened last fall. It's just, it's just a story of generosity. It was a couple that was relocated, not because of work, but because they retired. And they sold a business. And they had gone here for many, many years, decades, the Eastview Christian Church. Before they left, they gave us a check for $200,000. And the reason they did it is because they believed in the ministry that God is doing in this church. And I'm like, what, what generosity? They could have given that money to anybody for anything. But they gave it to us. Because they believe that God's doing something, how much more generous can we be? That's the question. So today I'm going to ask you to join me in winning this battle over the love of money and materialism and debt and greed to become generous people. So if you would, again, hold on to that money. That's yours. We'll see you June 3rd. Okay? Uh, But today, would you take this card out? I want to offer you a chance to, you know, to do something with this sermon. Sermons are great, but if you don't do something with them, what's the use? So on one side, is just check whatever applies. Put your name in there. Put your email or phone number, however you want to be contacted. If you need help making a budget, we're there for you. If you want to get involved in Financial Peace University, we're there. If you want more information about small groups and money and all that kind of stuff, we'll help you with that. If you want to read the treasure principle, check that box and go get a copy today. Um, If you want more information on how to tie, we want to help you. We're here to help you. On the other side, though, I want you to flip it and see, in light of today's teaching on money, I intend to. Listen, some of you just know you need to take this step. You need to start tithing. You've resisted it for years. Today's the day I'm going to start tithing. Some of you just need to go, I'm going to increase my giving to God's church at Eastview. I told the staff this last week as I was running through this. Um, Sarah and I are going to increase our giving $100 a month. It's not much, $50 a paycheck. We could do more. And in, in five or six months, we probably will do more. We just up it every once in a while because sometimes you have to look money in the face and say, you're not the boss of me. Right? And so maybe today you're giving a lot, but you just, can you give more? Maybe that's the generous step you take. Maybe you begin giving systematically and intentionally. Maybe you're one of those people that gives when you can or whenever. Maybe you start getting intentional about this. And then still maybe some of you uh, want to think strategically about how can I be generous with all the money that God's given me? How can I even go beyond the church and be more generous? Today, guys, I want God to do something in us. Reminder, next month, June 3rd, we'll come back, we'll take up an offering, and that will go for the Serve Project and other kingdom outreach events uh, here in this town. But um, I'm going to invite you to do something with those cards. If you fill them out, um, as we sing this next song, I uh, just want you to come back down and put them. we got four treasure boxes up here. And um, it's just, a, it's just a, a reaction to saying, God, by, by your grace, here's what I'm going to do. And uh, if you would, while we sing this song, just come on down. Come down from the balcony. we got time. And just say, God, here's the commitment that I'm going to make. I pray God's doing something in you today. And if he's not and you want to talk more about it, go to the family room. We'll address it there. But for right now, let's stand and respond as the Holy Spirit leads you. We follow Matt and the band.